Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Natalie Eddington, the Dean of the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, and I welcome you to our school, and I also welcome you to the annual American Pharmacists Association's Foundation's Annual Pinnacle Lecture. I bring greetings from our faculty staff and, and our students to all of you here that are here in person this afternoon, as well as those that are joining us via Blackboard Collaborate. The School of Pharmacy's proximity to the American Pharmacists Association headquarters in Washington, D.C. not only serves as well as it relates to hosting this lecture, but also has established a partnership and a, and a collaboration with the association and the foundation. Many of our faculty have held leadership positions within both organizations. Dr. Stuart Haynes, a professor of pharmacy practice and science, and one of the organizers of today's event is a member of the foundation's board of directors. And Tom Minigan, the APHA's executive director, is a member of our school's board of visitors. Several of our faculty have been the recipients of APH awards. Last year, Dr. Brent Reed received the new practitioner award, and Dr. Cherokee Lason Wolf received the Community Pharmacy Residency Excellence and Precepting Award, and Cherokee is sitting in the back with a yellow sweater on. And this year, Dr. Magali Rodriguez de Bittner, Professor of Pharmacy Practice and Science and the Executive Director of our Center for Innovative Pharmacy Solutions, is the recipient of the APHA Foundation's Pinnacle Award for Individual Career Achievements. And Magali has on stripes in the back. <laughs> which you will receive this tomorrow evening in, in Washington. So we're excited to uh, see her receive this and attend that. The important, progressive, impactful, and innovative interprofessional initiatives that positively enhance patient care are critical to the success of our new health care environment, but most importantly to the patients that we serve and we treat. The University of Maryland School of Pharmacy strongly believes we all need to be aware of these achievements and we must collectively celebrate the work that is being done around the country to improve human health and to improve the use of medications and positive health care outcomes for our patients. To that end, we are so proud to host this forum this afternoon with a co to celebrate the collaboration between Ohio State University's College of Pharmacy and the Division of General Internal Medicine as they share the successes seen by the interprofessional health care team. I'd now like to introduce Liz Keyes, Interim, Interim Executive Director of the APHA Foundation to introduce our speakers. Liz? Thank you so much, Dean Eddington. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here representing the APHA Foundation. Um, I'm also the Chief, uh, Chief Operating Officer of the American Pharmacists Association. So um, it's wonderful that we're here today to celebrate uh, the award winners of uh, the prestigious APHA Foundation Pinnacle Awards and how wonderful that we're going to have the opportunity to hear firsthand about the exciting work that one of the Pinnacle Award recipients, um, the group of them, um, is working on and how absolutely fortunate that we have a, a Pinnacle Award recipient as well in uh, Dr. DeBittner and you all are very familiar, I'm sure, with her work. So what a delight to be here today. Um, this is our second annual Pinnacle Award Lecture and, and uh, the partnership between the University of Maryland uh, College of Pharmacy and APHA Foundation is really a, a very important one. Um, so let me welcome you all here uh, that are in the room and also um, welcome those of you who are online listening. I don't want to go any further without thanking our sponsor, Amgen, for giving the foundation a grant for this uh, Pinnacle Award lecture. Their support has been very important in our being able to bring the lecture out to groups of individuals like you today. I also want to thank Dean Eddington, uh, Dr. Haynes, and Becky Cerule here at the College of Pharmacy who have been instrumental in setting up the logistics and, and uh, getting all of uh, us in the room here today. Um, I think you're going to walk away feeling really energized and excited about what you'll hear from our uh, colleagues at uh, The Ohio State University. Um, Dr. Haynes will be taking care of the moderating and um, taking questions 
uh, online, I don't begin to um, understand how that all works. So I'm going to uh, rely on a lot of smart people who uh, know how that works to uh, facilitate questions. Um, and I've left my clicker at my seat. <laughs> So this slide um, is, is really a little bit about the foundation and what our work is. It's really uh, an organization that's been around since uh, 1953. Um, and it's always been focused on uh, really supporting uh, APHA and pharmacists in the pursuit of uh, patient care. Our mission um, very clear, clearly states that we're here to improve people's health through uh, pharmacist patient care services. Uh, and we all know very clearly what that's all about. Uh, some of the work of the foundation um, is listed here, and I encourage you to visit our website, um, foundation, APHAfoundation.org, for more information. Um, the foundation has been uh, working on um, supporting the Pinnacle Awards since 1998, and when you look back at the innovation and success of the past award recipients, it's quite exciting. And uh, those who will be receiving the award tomorrow night in Washington um, certainly should feel very proud when looking back at the history of those individuals. And those of us who will be hearing about the practices uh, today, I think, are all very excited about what you're doing. So thank you. Uh, very much for that. Um, we're excited to have uh, representatives from Ohio State University here today, and thank you for coming out a day early to present the, the Pinnacle Award lecture. Um, hopefully everyone's received a handout when you uh, came in. Uh, the biographical sketches of our two presenters are included there. Uh, let me just say in brief that uh, Ohio State University College of Pharmacy and the Division of General Medicine have had pharmacist involvement in team-based care uh, since 2006, um, almost 10 years, so that's, that's pretty doggone exciting. During this time, the pharmacy team has grown from one shared faculty member in one clinic to four shared faculty members, one full-time pharmacist and three pharmacy residents practicing at five NCQA tier three patient care medical homes. The pharmacists provide lots of patient care services, and I know we'll be hearing a lot about um, those in the lecture to come. Uh, we are excited also because the lecture today will be talking about team-based care, and we know that that's very important um, as we all work toward a new uh, level of service provided by pharmacists. And seeing these uh, innovative practices are really what uh, the Pinnacle Award and uh, the APHA Foundation work is all about. So uh, without further ado, let me please introduce to you uh, Dr. Beatty and Dr. Tyal, who will give the lecture. Do the slide transitions occur just by hitting the clicker here? All right. Very good. Thank you so much for the invitation to come out. And uh, I really appreciate the opportunity for Dr. Beatty and I to tell you about the work that we've been doing at OSU. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is give you just a brief introduction of myself so you kind of know my background. Uh, we'll talk about the Medical Center and its uh, evolution over the last um, six to eight years. Uh, we'll talk about the growth of our division specifically. And finally, probably the most important, is to talk about how we made a decision consciously to fully integrate uh, clinical pharmacists into our practice. So I'll try to go through this fairly quickly because I want to leave plenty of time for Dr. Beatty to talk about um, the specific work that they've been doing. So uh, a quick background on myself. Uh, I've been in practice for, I'm going on 15 years now, and have had a mix of clinical services and administrative duties. I've managed a clinic, a large, busy uh, academic practice, and for the last five years, I've served as the division director. And it's important to keep those dates in mind because the evolution that I've gone through has kind of gone in line with <coughs> bringing our clinical pharmacists uh, in. But uh, the highlights for the medical center, it's like most academic medical centers. It's been uh, experiencing a tremendous amount of growth. Uh, there's a $1 billion growth plan over the last uh, five to six years. Uh, we have a new Ross Heart Hospital and a new cancer clinic that's been built. Uh, and it's a, a truly remarkable institution. Uh, not only do we have a comprehensive suite of clinical services, 
but we have a very large education mission when, that, when it comes to medical students, to residents, all the way to fellowship training. It's a very dynamic environment with a tremendous opportunity uh, to, be, to be a teacher. Um, it's obviously an institution for investigation and new discovery. Um, it, it is a truly remarkable place to work. One of the really exciting things about working at OSU is their electronic medical record because it's a fully integrated system top to bottom within one electronic EMR and it's really changed the dynamics of the kind of collaborative relationships that can be built uh, when you have that kind of infrastructure in place. Uh, the other thing that's exciting about working at OSU is the campus and much like yours we have a number of colleges just within about a two to three block area. So our College of Pharmacy is very close to the College of Medicine, close to the College of Nursing, and we have the College of Public Health. Again, all within a fairly uh, small environment. And what I've really tried to do over the years is try to really take advantage of that opportunity. And we've built collaboratives with a lot of different colleges. I would say the College of Pharmacy collaboration has probably been our most uh, fruitful uh, collaboration. But it's kind of the model of why I try to pursue other uh, collaboratives. Uh, the medical center, like I said, is doing uh, great in a lot of different ways, but it has challenges. Um, healthcare is changing, as it always does. One of the big challenges that our medical center faces is uh, the distribution of providers. And what you see in the screen uh, on the right side is an upside down pyramid of how the different physician groups are stratified. And what you'll see is that primary care in a lot of academic medical centers is fairly small compared to the size of the specialist and subspecialist. And that's worked well in the past because we've worked inside of an open network system where patients across all central Ohio could go to any hospital system they wanted. But over time that is changing and the medical center sees that as uh, a challenge to adapt to uh, and about five years ago put together a strategic plan to grow primary care services. A lot of organizations around the country are doing that through purchasing private practices, um, affiliating with private practices. What OSU's done is really set a course of expanding their own faculty groups and through affiliation. So they're not taking the approach of purchasing, but more so affiliations and growing. So they charged us about four to five years ago with doubling uh, the size of our, of, of our general internal medicine practice and the same thing for our family medicine group. Uh, that's not such an easy thing to do, to grow that much. Part of the reasons are there isn't as big a pool of candidates uh, in primary care. And some, there's complex issues about why people don't pursue careers in primary care. Some of it has to do with salaries, and this illustration demonstrates the, uh, the uh, gap in salaries. Now, I don't think anybody could say that physicians aren't paid well, uh, but again, when you're a medical student with a large uh, uh, debt load coming out of college, some of these more lucrative fields are obviously a, a draw. Uh, I'm happy to say, though, I think in the last three to four years, I've seen a significant change in the, not only the number, but also the quality of the applicants pursuing primary care has improved significantly. Um, there's other pressing issues, too, other than just insurance changes. There's also changes in demographics. Obviously, the large baby boom generation is now well into their getting into a 65 and plus range, and the number of people that we have to manage with chronic illnesses is growing. And health systems uh, acknowledge that, and it's simply another reason why they want to expand primary care. Um, so, so that's kind of the medical center's uh, position on this. Uh, I came to my role as a division director about five years ago. And over that time, we basically doubled in size, like I mentioned. These are our clinics that are spread around uh, the city. We started with three, we're up to six, and we'll be growing to seven uh, primary care clinics uh, around central Ohio. Uh, the services that we provide in our clinics, uh, we have 158 healthcare professionals. And I specifically don't start by listing the number of physicians because I tend to try to think of healthcare professionals in a, in a broad sense, in a flat uh, manner. So we have uh, 48 physicians. We have 80 medical residents that rotate through our continuity clinic. Uh, 10 nurse practitioner and PAs. We have five clinical pharmacists in total currently. And we have three social workers and then 12 nurse case managers. And the biggest things that's changed in our practice is bringing pharmacists in and bringing nurse case managers. Uh, that's probably been the most dramatic change over time. Uh, we manage about 50,000 lives and we have about 100,000 office visits per year. I don't manage all this by myself. I have a remarkable team of leaders, physician leaders at all of our practices and you can see their names there. Uh, what I can tell you about this group is that they're optimistic they're not averse to change, and they like solving problems. And those are the three qualities I tend to look for. Uh, and, and if they look a little youthful, 
that's fine. We don't have to have, you know, we can have an even distribution of uh, demographics in our position group too. So, so it's a great group and they've been really open-minded about bringing new professionals, meaning nurse case managers and physicians into our practice. So, so they deserve a lot of credit for the transition we've gone through. Um, the clinical services that we provide, it's, uh, it's fundamental general internal medicine, so it's adult primary care services is a bulk of what we do. Uh, we have med peds physicians, so pediatrics is a big part of our practice. We have 14 practicing board certified pediatricians. We have a geriatrics program. And what I really like to highlight, because I think it's really relevant to what we've done with our clinical pharmacists, is we really aim to take care of complex care patients. We're general internists. We do primary care, but really it's specifically for this population. So again, large populations of complex issues with our resident clinic population, our diabetes clinics. Some of these things are what Dr. Beatty's going to talk about. We started a home visiting program for just really complex patients that are homebound. We run a preoperative clinic uh, for high risk patients, and then obviously we take a lot of transfers from the hospital. Um, so that's just the context, the background of myself, of the medical center, and how our division fits into the strategic plan for the medical center. I'd like to speak just a couple of minutes more about how pharmacy uh, came to be such a large part of our operations. And it actually traces its history back to the opioid uh, epidemic. Uh, so I went into practice in 2000, right at the start there. And uh, in the first six years, I worked in a uh, residence continuity clinic. And we had a tremendous number of patients uh, on chronic pain meds. And we kind of were front line dealing with that uh, crisis. Uh, 2006, to sort of hit a peak, and, and that's when we first met Dr. Beatty because he was coming right out of uh, training and somebody referred him to our practice to specifically help us uh, manage these patients with chronic uh, opioid uh, use and try to do it safer. Okay, so 2011 is when, uh, when, when I think we really had a tipping point where the faculty would day in and day out uh, see the clinical pharmacist in the clinic and they would start reaching out to them and very quickly they started realizing the benefits of coordinating with a, with a pharmacist in primary care. So it was a really pivotal time. Uh, I, got, I got to tip my hat to Kelly Barnes and Shannon Peter because the way they conducted themselves in that first year's residence really made an impression on a lot of physicians and it gave me the confidence to say we can take the next step with this group. So I label them as our pioneers and a lot of what you see is really I think that group, that group of three people, this group of three people really deserve a lot of the credit of where we've, where we've come to. So uh, really quickly, what are our current collaboratives? Well, the way we work this is a shared, it's a shared position with the College of Pharmacy. We pay 25% salary. College of Pharmacy pays 25% for their clinical services. So in total, half their time is in our practice, and the rest is academic duties. Uh, we've hired one additional uh, clinical pharmacist directly into our practice. Um, we have the pharmacist placed at all of our clinic sites, and really they're engaged in all our missionaries. It's not just clinical care. Uh, we're developing new clinical programs all the time, and they're engaged in that. Education, they give lectures to our residents and attendings, and in scholarship, we've had a number of research projects that we've conducted collaboratively. Um, what's next? Well, I jokingly tell Stu that really we're just getting started. Uh, there's a lot more to be done. Primary care is a dynamic field, uh, and, and I'm looking forward to, to engaging the group in some of these new initiatives uh, over the coming year. I'll stop there and turn the mic over to Dr. Beatty. Thank you. Okay, we'll see if I'm 
sounds like I'm on. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the things we've done um, within pharmacy practice within our group. Um, I'm going to talk about several of our initiatives, so I, this may seem like I'm going through this pretty quickly, but I want to talk about not just one thing that we do, because we do lots of stuff. Um, so just bear with me. If you have questions, I'll be happy to take questions at the end. We're going to kind of start with our team visits, because um, really our diabetes clinic model is, is what kind of started us off. Dr. Tile talked about how that was in 2008. Um, and the way that our model works is we have an internal medicine resident, and it's part of the educational mission Every single internal medicine resident rotates through diabetes clinic with our pharmacist in, a team in this team-based environment. So we go in and jointly interview these patients and gather the history. Um, these are internal referrals, so these are just patients within our own network, uh, so we don't take outside referrals for this. And then our internal medicine resident is going to perform a diabetes-focused exam. At that point, we're going to get our attending physician and our students and all these different people. We kind of have a posse that walks around. Sometimes we're probably too big of a posse. There's lots of us. But uh, we get shared decision-making. We involve the patient in as much of that as we can. We do a lot of motivational interviewing, all those key catchphrases. We do have access to a social worker to help with medication assistance if needed for our patients. And we come up with shared decision-making for that patient. Um, and then we deliver some pharmacist-specific um, diabetes education, and we help set some personalized goals with those patients before they leave. And then the follow-up occurs, and typically this comes back to pharmacy, although sometimes it's the resident, the medical residents, and sometimes it's nurses. But usually it's pharmacy that takes initiative to either telephonically or now we do electronically, which is great. Uh, follow up with those patients and allows us to do some insulin titration, just check in and see how they're doing with those personalized goals. This really started back in 2008. And then we were fortunate enough in 2011 to be one of the Project Impact Diabetes sites, and here are the 25 different uh, sites that were part of that study. And just from our own uh, data, we had 98 patients that we contributed in the one-year follow-up of that study, and you can see the average age here is 56, and a, pretty much a 50-50 breakdown on male, female, and African-American and white. And for our results, so the OSU results are in red. Uh, so we had an A1C drop of 9.9 .9 to 8.5, which was statistically significant. And then I have in black the overall results of all uh, nearly 1,700 patients who were involved in the study. Um, so we certainly contributed to that. But this is our diabetes model, which continues, um, has now expanded to a couple of the other clinics. Um, and again, I think is a really key point for us to interact with our medical residents and teach them where pharmacists can interact. And it's, it's really a team-based environment. So it really grew from there. We had this, this model, and it grew to our polypharmacy clinic model next. And I like to talk about the polypharmacy clinic model, which was really the idea of one of our geriatricians. So that's the exciting part to me is about in 2011, this shift also occurred where instead of me as the pharmacist coming up with ideas and trying to talk to our physician, they started coming up with ideas and coming to us and saying, how do we, how do we get involved with this stuff? So we had a similar model with polypharmacy. And we had, again, our internal medicine residents all rotate through this, and our pharmacists jointly perform a comprehensive medication review. And we have the patient bring in all of their bottles. So these are very complicated patients, which you'll see. Uh, we, again, include the, the patient in the decision-making. We have our geriatrician that serves as the attending for this. This is also expanded to other clinics. And then we deliver a personalized medication record. And then typically for this, what happens, really the goal of this is to get rid of medicines. People are on too many medications. So we have them back after four weeks because often we want to get them off of more meds than we can do in one visit. Um, so we have them back in four weeks, sometimes two or three visits out to continue to have them back and monitoring. And in the meantime, they are still seeing their primary care physician, their primary care team to manage those other diseases. So if you look at our uh, results from this, we study this for the first year, and this is only happening a half a day per week. So again, we have nearly 100 patients here, and the average age, I think, is important to point out because the average age is 60. So these aren't patients that are all in Medicare. A lot of times when you think polypharmacy, you hear about polypharmacy, you're hearing about the older population. Our average age is, is only 60 here. Um, our breakdown otherwise um, is about 50-50 male, female, again, 50-50 African American and white. And again, more than 50% of these are Medicare patients, but a lot of these are Medicare that are long-term disability patients, not necessarily over the age of 65. And our results here, so our average number of medications at the beginning, which is in the red, um, these patients are on, in the EMR, they're on an average of 20 medications. So the first thing we do is we go through all the different pill bottles that they have that they bring in. 
Um, and just by doing that, that gets us to the, the blue column, which is just our medication reconciliation of really just cleaning up that med list, which that alone can take 45 minutes with some of these people. Um, so the average of that, that takes them down to 19 medications. Um, and some of these people, by the way, we're adding medicines on, we're taking things off. This is just to get, what are you taking today? And then we have this intervention where we identify the potential adverse drug events. Um, and then based on that, we make changes to the medications and then we peel off another, we get down to 17.7. So just by coming in that one visit, um, we're taking off uh, two to, nearly two to three medications per patient for those individuals. And if we look, when we looked at the actual cost of that, that was a decrease in more than $12,000 per month, which was about more than $100 uh, per patient. So that's either cost of the patient or cost of the system, cost of the insurer somewhere, uh, just by going to this polypharmacy clinic. And this is data just from the first visit. So again, a lot of these patients come back for a second, a third visit. We've had patients that are all the way up to 54 medications when they come in. So those are the patients we're dealing with. We're dealing with pretty sick individuals here. Um, certainly people that are beyond the polypharmacy of five, of five medications. We, we don't see people with only five medications very often in our clinic. So then let's move forward with some more stuff about cost and our third party cost savings. So within Ohio, uh, we have CareSource, which is the largest Medicaid managed health plan within the state. And one of the unique things about CareSource is CareSource will reimburse pharmacists for pharmacists provided care. And they use the Outcomes MTM platform for this. Um, so typically this is done in the community pharmacies using Outcomes MTM. CareSource, we actually ask them the question, we happen to practice in the physician's office, will you pay us? And they said, absolutely, your pharmacist, you're providing good care. Um, so we're actually getting reimbursed using Outcomes MTM for our CareSource patients. So we looked at a little bit over the first year of, of having this available to us. Um, you can see we had 348 different claims that were accepted and paid. 128 of those were the comprehensive med review. And then there were 220 interventions, which is highlighted in blue, that we will pull forward. Some of those are the tips, so the targeted interventions that would come up on outcomes, and some of those are things that we've identified when we're um, visiting with patients or when they come in for a regular visit. So again, our characteristics here, this is 157 patients, so we had 220 interventions on. Um, our age, the younger population here, this is a Medicaid population, so we're 53. Um, otherwise, the breakdown, again, is pretty much 50-50. And here are the number and types of interventions that we are making. And the, the big thing here uh, to point out is, be, I think this is because we're in the, the physician's office and we have the physicians right there with us, um, when we document this and we put this into Outcomes MTM, a lot of what we're doing is unnecessary prescription therapy, needs drug therapy there in the purple, and then in the orange we have dose too low and suboptimal drug. So compared to our colleagues that are doing this in the community pharmacy, we're right in the physician's office so we can get these changes made right away. So I think that impacts the type of interventions that we're able to make. When we looked at what does this actually mean, so when we pulled um, the level that's, this is all based on outcomes MTM data, um, and we worked with CareSource to actually find what's the estimated cost avoidance, and in the blue we calculated that out ourselves based on medications uh, that were stopped or that we switched, so that's based on actual wholesale price, and we calculated that ourselves at 20000 You can see here we uh, had a total estimated cost avoidance of over $150,000 for these 220 interventions. Um, so that's almost $700 per intervention of estimated cost avoidance. So another thing that we do is uh, we work within population management. So I'll show one of our examples of what we do with population management. And population management to us, this is one of the first things we started doing with Dr. Tile. We started working closely on these population management ideas. Um, and really in the gray here, it's the same format for each one of these projects that we've done. We identify what population we want to focus on. We use our EMR to generate some type of report to identify our patients. We're going to implement the intervention, and then we're going to track our outcomes and um, update the EMR, then it's going to circle back around. So this is a continuous quality improvement uh, workflow. For the uh, study that I'm going to highlight, so we did this in our chronic kidney disease population. So what we did is we ran a report um, from our EMR of all of our patients to identify all of our patients had an estimated GFR of less than 60. We then went and confirmed that they actually had stage three or worse chronic kidney disease. We looked through all of those patients' charts 
and we looked at the KDOKI recommendations at the time to see if they were up to date on their lab work. Um, if they had all the medications that were recommended for that patient population. And then we looked at all of their medications in total to see if they were renally dose adjusted as they should be. Um, and then we updated the EMR, we communicated that with the primary care physician and again cycled that back through. So in our population here, um, one thing to point out, chronic kidney disease, these are again complicated patients. So our average number of meds here, we're at 13. So I keep pointing out the number of meds that our patients are on to show the complexity of the patients that we're caring for. So the, the result that I'm going to share with you is the, the medication safety part of this and the renal dose adjustment. We did see improvements um, in getting labs drawn. So for the common labs such as Chem7s and CBCs, most of our patients were pretty good at that. But the vitamin D, um, the PTH, like some of those more chronic kidney disease specific labs, we did show an improvement from those. Uh, but I wanted to focus on the meds here. So of our patients, we, we looked at 1,645 medications um, that did not require any renal dose adjusting at all. So we just left them alone. And then we saw there were 270 medications, which was more than one medication per patient, that actually should be, and we used micrometics as our source, that based on micrometics, it should be renally dose adjusted. And we saw basically a 50-50 breakdown at baseline of the patients that had that medication dosed appropriately per micrometics, or it actually needed to be adjust adjusted, or in some instances actually stopped because it was contraindicated for that particular patient. And when we pull that forward after our pharmacist intervention, you can see that that increased. Um, we went up to 80% of those medications um, were actually dosed appropriately by putting our intervention in place. Um, and then we still had 17% of them were not. And a lot of those were because maybe the dose was outside the range, but it was determined that it was clinically insignificant. The patient was benefiting from that. They weren't having adverse drug events. Um, so this was actually published in pharmacotherapy. This is Dr. Barnes's residency project. So um, thank you to her for seeing this all the way through. Um, and to our knowledge, at least as far as I know, I think that this is the first outpatient renal dose adjustment program that's been published that's been done in the country. Um, so I, I think it might be. If it isn't, then it's one of the first. Um, a lot of data on this in the inpatient setting, but not much on the outpatient setting. So pretty exciting stuff that we've done there. And then transitional care management is something that we started uh, when they came up with those new transitional care management codes, which I guess has now been almost three years ago. Time flies, I guess. So our workflow, this is, this is very, very busy, and it's not meant for anybody to actually understand this much. But this, shows, this displays the workflow of how we take care of this within general internal medicine. And the thing to point out is at the bottom of this, we have the primary care physician all the way at the bottom very involved in this process. So they actually receive within our EMR any time one of their patients is discharged from the emergency department or from an OSU hospital, they get a notification. So they are meant to um, look through that. And what we tell our physicians is if they want to see that patient within two weeks, either because of the complexity of the patient from them knowing the patient or because of what they were in the hospital for, what they do is they will route that to us and we have a pool set up that our pharmacists share and we will actually make a phone call within two business days of discharge. So we will call that patient at home and see how they're doing. Um, as far as what we do on that phone call, we really spend a lot of our time, obviously, on medication reconciliation. So making sure that they pick things up, like their antibiotic or something like that. We make sure that if they were supposed to stop a medication, they didn't restart it once they got home. We spend a lot of time on their status. So how are they doing? Making sure that they're at least even with how they were when they got discharged. They're not doing worse. And then we want to make sure that they're scheduled for follow-up to come in and see their primary care physician within that two-week work, within that two-week time frame. So early on, we just kind of wanted to track this and see what we even had. Um, we did 671 of these within the first really 12, 13 months. And again, our average medications, because, by, because we have the PCP involved, we, our average medications were about 15. So again, a pretty sick population. So patients that were in for elective surgeries, those were not sent to us. Patients that didn't need to be seen for follow-up for maybe a month or two, those aren't sent to us. These are the sick people that are being sent to us. You can see I highlighted as well the high-risk medications that people were on, so the opioids, the anticoagulants, antibiotics, and insulin. So just by making this phone call, if we don't do anything else, what we found out is that before we made this phone call, 
about 60% of the patients were not scheduled for any type of follow-up. I will say this was early on, so I think that this has improved drastically. Uh, but just by making that phone call, we were able to get them scheduled to see their primary care physician. So we like to think we were doing more than this, but at least we were getting them scheduled to see their primary care physician. Our overall um, readmission rate for this population was 12.9%, um, which sounds great. The problem with that is what do you actually compare that to? What does that mean? Um, so we're actually in the midst of looking at all of our data and we're trying to get this matched to some other patients that aren't within our group to see if our um, readmission rate is better. But at some point of comparison, the overall medical center re readmission rate is 11.6%. But when we look at in the red line, those that are on the internal medicine services, which is where a lot of our patients are going to come from, um, that is actually at 15%. So we are uh, quite a bit better than those on the internal medicine services. A lot of our patients will come from there, but certainly not, not all of them. But then if we go a little bit further and break it down, we have, um, of those that we've looked at, about 210 of them, we've reached 184 of those patients. So by reaching the patient, you can see how much better that uh, readmission rate, how much lower that is at 11.9% compared to it's up to 17% of those people we never were able to get a hold of. So again, that phone call is, is definitely making a difference by getting a hold of that patient. And then the same thing says for those that actually went all the way to showing up, not only do we call them, but those that showed up for that primary care appointment, that readmission rate drops down to 10%, um, and those that did not show, it goes to 17%. Now, there are probably some people in that 17% that we called, and then it was actually determined that they needed to go back to the hospital. Um, so they were readmitted, but we knew that they were readmitted and thought that they needed to be. But this is the outcomes that we have at this point for our transitions of care. But that's not all that we do. That's what I have data on. Um, other things that we do, we're very involved in our anticoagulation management. Um, we were working closely with those nurse case managers to kind of figure out the workflow on these new chronic care management codes across our network. Uh, we have, Dr. Tile mentioned that we've uh, hired a pharmacist, a full-time pharmacist within the division, and part of her responsibilities are the OSU Healthy at Home program. That's a home visit program that we have within the division, which has one physician and two nurse practitioners that care for 250, about 250 patients that are homebound within the central Ohio area. So we have a pharmacist that's helping over the phone and eventually will be making some home visits with those patients. We have our CAST group, which is a Center for Autism Services and Transition. So there's a group at one of those MedPeds clinics, um, which is really focusing on transitioning uh, patients with autism, diagnosed autism, They've been managed by a pediatrician, now they're transitioning to adulthood, so an interdisciplinary team, which uh, Deb Barnett is part of that group, and doing some research and tracking some stuff from that. We are starting at the end of next month. Our geriatrician group um, is starting a cognitive impairment assessment clinic, so this is, again, internal referrals. So anybody that uh, they want to have come and be assessed for uh, just overall dementia or Alzheimer's, it's going to be a multidisciplinary group. We'll have pharmacy involved in that to look at all the medications and see if anything could be contributing there. And then another thing that we do, we're getting ready to ramp up as well, is we do Medicare Part D selection. Um, so last year uh, we actually uh, studied, and we're going to be publishing, hopefully, one of our resident projects, and uh, we helped over 100 people pick their Medicare Part D plan, and we found that by doing that, uh, those patients saved uh, an average of about six to $700, hopefully, in 2015. Uh, because we helped them get on the right plan. There were numerous patients that got signed up for a plan for the first time. Lots of those patients got signed up for low-income subsidy for the first time because they didn't even know that was an option. There was one patient in particular that was actually receiving chemotherapy, and uh, we saved him almost $12,000 uh, by coming in and getting on the right plan for him. So a big impact there. Um, that's a service that we aren't getting paid for, uh, but there's a, that's a big benefit to our patients and we'd like to think that that's a big benefit for our physicians because they don't have to deal with as many prior offs uh, because we're hopefully getting them on the right plan. So I know that was really fast, but hopefully there will be lots of questions if you want me to go into more detail on any of that. But the summary of all this is the future of where healthcare is going. We again are, have a, in the midst of a significant primary care shortage. Um, there's going to be more primary care physicians that are coming out, uh, but pharmacists need to figure out a way to help fill this void as well. 
team-based care is something that is that is here and is going to as well be growing. Um, that's something that we've uh, we've definitely focused on. You could hopefully see from the slides um, and really doing team management of these patients. Um, this is comes from a report from October 2012 from the Institute of Medicine. So if anybody wants to read up on what they say about team-based care, this is a good good reference for you. And the other place we're going is in value-based payments. So this has been the newest, and that if you haven't read this article, uh, this is in the New England Journal, but this actually comes from um, HHS, and saying that 50% of Medicare and Medicaid payments should be value-based um, in the next three years. Um, so value-based payments, well, we're trying to figure out what that means. Um, I would like to think that the stuff that we've been working on is showing value and is adding value back to the system, so hopefully we can, we can use some of that data to show that pharmacists should be involved in that care. So where does pharmacy fit in, at least as far as I'm concerned? I've been asked this before, so I've come up with a very rudimentary way to graphically show this to people. So I like to think of patients and the complexity of patients on this bell-shaped curve. And if you look at us working in the primary care office, where is it that we fit in? There's certainly other areas of pharmacy. We're in the community and they're in these different places. But I think we are right here. So these are those patients that are pretty complex. Um, when they get all the way to the end there, um, they need lots of different people involved. But when you have patients that are, that are pretty, have pretty serious diseases, lots of different diseases stacked on top of one another, they end up on lots of medicines. And when people end up on lots of medicines, you need to have pharmacists involved. So this is, I think, where we are. I don't know if we ever intentionally meant to target this group, but I feel like everything that we keep doing ends up being in this highlighted area right here. So how do we get there? So at the end of this, I have a couple of quotes that I like. One is by Voltaire, so the perfect is the enemy of the good. So I think this is important for us to remember as a profession, that sometimes I think we're always out there, we're perfectionists because we're pharmacists and we're type A, and sometimes we've got to take a step back and not always try to get to the perfect, but just be willing to be okay with the good and start something out, because you can always improve it as you go along. And then finally, don't be afraid to go out on a limb, because that's where all the fruit is. So you've got to be willing to go out there and uh, take a, go for some of that low-hanging fruit, get yourself started, because that certainly has proven well for us. And with that, I will stop, and we will open it up for questions either in the room or online. So we're happy to take some questions from anybody in the room that would like to have one in there. And for anyone that's online, if you want to type in your question into the chat box, we've already received a couple. So if there's anyone in the room who'd like to go first, we can take that, or I can read one of the online questions. So, all right, I'm going to bring the microphone to you because our home audience would really love to. Okay, there we go. So, thank you very much for that presentation. I actually have two questions. Question number one relates to the data from Care Source uh, using the outcome data. So, a lot of the savings that you showed us are, again, savings that are. Um, calculated based on, you know, what you avoided, so cost avoidance. Have you guys done anything to look at actual savings and trying to analyze that cohort to see how much did you actually save versus predicted savings? So we, so good question. We have not done that yet with the CareSource patients. We actually worked with CareSource to get that data back. Um, so the estimated cost avoidance that we showed you is actually not the same as what they would use from Outcomes MTM. They have a different algorithm that they use at CareSource, so this is actually under what you would get if you used the same values for estimated cost avoidance from Outcomes. Uh, but we haven't gone and actually looked at those patients to see did anything happen to them either before, during, or after, or compare them to a matched cohort. We have not done that. Okay, thank you. And my second question relates to uh, billing that you're doing for a lot of these services. Um, could you comment in uh, things like transition of care codes, like uh, chronic care management codes? And you know how in our profession we have this whole debate about, you know, can pharmacists bill for those? How do physician practices, you know, could uh, pay for pharmacists because they can't bill for those codes? Could you comment a little bit about some of what you do internally to build for those, and I would love to hear also your physician colleague comment on the value of the pharmacist in the clinic. 
Sure. So I'll, I'll start about how we build, and I'll let you talk about what that actually means, because you look at the numbers. Um, so as far as, uh, as our billing, if it's a pharmacist-only visit, we will bill instant twos. We will bill a 99211. Um, so if they come in just to see us. Our diabetes clinic and our polypharmacy clinic are seen by medical residents, um, and they're seen by attending physicians. So those actually get billed as a typical office visit would with a physician. Um, there is a higher level that can occur because of the complexity and because of what the pharmacist adds, but they will bill those as high-level uh, visits that a physician would bill. Uh, for care source, we use outcomes, so we will bill for that uh, comprehensive med review, and then we will bill for any tip that we see through outcomes. Um, so that will take place, and that's direct billing that comes back to the division. As far as the transitions of care, um, that model that we have is set up so that we can bill those transitions of care management codes. That bill actually takes place at the time of the physician visit. There's additional reimbursement that comes in to essentially pay for the telephonic or the non-face-to-face -face part of that visit that we have, and we have the numbers as far as um, how many of those we've had actually come back in. Um, and the chronic care management is the same way. We have our nurses and our pharmacists kind of all contributing to the time that it takes for our chronic care management patients, uh, but that's going to take place at the end of each month. Um, so that's at least how we bill for all the different things that I talked about, and then I'll let you talk about what those numbers are. Is this microphone on? Okay, good. Um, you know, as far as the, 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 just to build on what Dr. Beatty was referring to, there's all these new primary care services it almost seems like every year, year or two, uh, if you look at the Federal Registry, you'll see new opportunities uh, to basically be paid for the time we spend in between office visits managing care. And I usually look at the first rendition and then I look at it later on when the rules are finalized. And a pattern you really see is this kind of openness to make sure that ancillary staff, as they put it, uh, have a role in that. So the first, um, you know, a lot of comments it's a debate back and forth about who should be allowed to do this, but in the end, the pattern I see is it's an expansion to let nurses, to let medical assistants, to let social workers, to let pharmacists engage in those services. So I think that's a really uh, key pattern, and I hope that will continue because it really, um, I think, is a realistic approach. Um, you know, as far as the value that clinical pharmacists bring, probably the best, you know, the word I tend to use is perfect medication because, you know, in, in, as physicians, when we look at a medication list, we think of it very similarly to the way a clinical pharmacist looks at it in the sense that we want to know, is it, is it the right indication? Is it the right dose? Is the duration correct? They're fairly deep questions on every single medication we look at. So there's a lot of processes going on. And in a way, we're kind of isolated. There aren't other people that do that. And when I mentioned the tipping point earlier, um, I think that's what's happening in our practices. Our physicians are starting to realize I have a colleague as a clinical pharmacist that thinks very similarly to the way I do, and they have a high level of respect because they can see the kind of uh, recommendations and the kind of feedback that comes from our clinical pharmacists, and they're just like, wow, that is really helpful. Um, what I'm really proud of is that we have 80 residents that rotate through our practice. So they are now at a very early point in their career starting to realize the importance of having this type of colleague in your practice. So I think the greatest value is, is just that, that you have a, a partner that respects what is really a very dangerous intervention uh, and, and can really partner with you to make it a, a better experience for our patients and, and to teach youngsters um, that this is how your practice probably ought to run in the future and hopefully advocate for that. We do have a question from online which I want to read. Um, it's directed to both um, Dr. Beatty and Dr. Dale. Um, so do the pharmacists and the physicians in your practice have collaborative practice agreements or some sort of treatment protocol that would facilitate the adoption of many of the pharmacist's recommendations that you uh, talked about during your presentation? Um, if not, why not? What are the key barriers? Good question. So I will take the first stab at this. So we do not use the formal consult agreement that is in place in Ohio. And the reason for that um, is because, to be honest, it's a pretty cumbersome the way that it's, that it's written right now. It's for um, one medication for one disease state between one pharmacist and one physician. Um, so, it's, so it's, yeah, everybody's, everybody's already laughing. So it's pretty cumbersome to go through that. Um, so what we do do, um, we're fortunate enough to have the EMR, and we all use the same EMR. So we can put in our recommendations and, and route that back easily to the physician. 
Uh, because we have physicians that work with medical residents, they're used to kind of being inundated in their inbox all the time. Um, so they can see those things. We can put in a medication order and pin that, so all that they have to do is hit accept, and it's taken, it, it's signed, and it's sent to the pharmacy electronically. The same for labs. So that's the way that, that we function. We do not have um, written, we do not follow a written formal consult agreement. Um, I will say that make a plea for, in the state of Ohio, they're hopefully changing that collaborative practice law, and they're supposed to be voting on that soon. And actually, I and one of our physicians went to testify uh, for that. Um, and then it's going to be much more broad, and it'll say you can, as a pharmacist, I can work with one physician to take care of their panel of patients. And I think if that passes, we'll, we'll be more likely to actually use that, and it'll be more beneficial to our uh, practice. Yeah, my quick comment would be, I can see that that is a barrier to some of what we could accomplish. Uh, you know, what, one of the ways we get around it is that when I try to design a clinic, you know, a lot of my work's actually been designing blueprints, which is really fun. It's actually probably the part of the job I like the most, <laughs> because you can really think deeply about, as you situate people in their work, how's that going to affect the long-term output. So I really try to design layouts where the pharmacists are literally shoulder to shoulder with those uh, physicians and nurses, and it just makes a world of difference. Ten feet can make a difference versus four feet. So I really try to bring them in close. And so we don't, and I think we've been able to take that and, and garner a lot of benefit and maybe take down some of those barriers. Are there any additional questions from folks here in the room? Wendy. Um, so it appears that right now your partnership is supported by personnel just supporting pieces of FTE. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Um, have you had discussions about other models of maybe revenue sharing or um, in, you know, billing, you know, sort of, could you talk about that a little bit? Um, so we haven't had a whole lot of discussion. We've been under this model for... I don't know how many years now, quite a few years. Um, and, and as we've added more people on, we've just kind of duplicated the model we had in place. Um, again, I think it's important to point out that um, we kind of get that a lot as far as like, oh, well, sure, you can have a pharmacist there because they're paying for only half of it and, and this and that. But I, it's important to point out that this group and Dr. Tile just hired a 1.0 FTE clinical pharmacist himself uh, because of the value that's going to come from that. So um, we look at, and he looks at, the billing that comes in um, from all of the providers, including us. Uh, we haven't gone down the path as far as do we look at billing sharing, revenue sharing. It's not looked at as that. It's kind of looked at, I guess, to go back into the pot that's, in, in a sense, going over to the College of Pharmacy to help pay for us, I would say. Any other questions that people have here in Baltimore? Well, I do have a question for uh, the both of you. So you, you spoke, uh, spoke about population management and identifying high-risk patients, and the one project you presented to us to hear today was about patients with renal dysfunction and addressing medication-related issues to that very specific population. What, is, what are your next steps? What are your next projects that are more population-based, identifying patients who are at risk for something related to medications and dealing with it at a population level rather than as a one-on, you know, one-off kind of situation, waiting for the referrals to kind of come in, but proactively looking at the entire population that you take care of and try to, you know, basically prevent those, those issues from happening. Sure. Uh, so some of the other projects that we've done for population management, we've done a project on preventative health where we looked at all of our patients um, and if they've received Zostavax or not. So then, as the pharmacist, we went through and review, reviewed to make sure that they could receive Zostavax. There weren't any contraindications, which we might not have to worry about in another year or two, but at the time, we did. Um, we've also done that where we've looked at specific medications. So we, we pulled everybody from our practice that's on a bisphosphonate, and we looked at, um, was their renal function okay? Should they be on it? But we also looked at, um, when was their most recent DEXA, and what's their FRAC score to show, should, it, should they be on or should they not be on it? Try to look at the calcium stuff at the same time, although the same time we were doing that project, the calcium stuff got a little gray. Um, so we've looked at that. Um, we've talked about doing that. Um, we actually have done that some for our narcotics population. So we've looked at our patients around narcotics, and we go back and we look to make sure that they're up to date on uh, toxicology screens, that they have a written 
um, a signed uh, agreement in place, and, and we've done, for us, our prescription monitoring program, ORS, that all of that stuff's up to date. Um, so we've kind of done different things. We've done preventative health. We've looked at disease population. We've done specific medications. Um, we've talked about doing some more of that stuff um, as far as that goes. I think there's some newer stuff that's coming out that we've tried to get involved with within our EMR where it's starting to identify. Um, so, for example, we can look at Dr. Tile, and I can actually see this report, and I can see directly on my screen, here's his patients that have poorly controlled diabetes. So they have an A1C above 11%. So we can start to work collaboratively to say, hey, we've identified these patients. How about if we start co-managing them or identifying them more in a population way instead of historically, it would just kind of be like, hey, this patient's in today and they're having a problem. Can you start to get involved in their care? And yeah. you may have. Yeah, my response would be, it's what I alluded to earlier. We're really just getting started because things are about to change dramatically. Um, the medical center's been on this electronic medical record for eight years. They have 125,000 patient portal users and they're just instituting this year a population management tool, and there's 20 different modules, so HIV, heart failure, uh, COPD, osteoporosis, and what it does is it drills down data by individual physician, and you can identify uh, gaps in care, and a lot of those have to do with medical therapies. So, and now the insurance industry in Central Ohio is really starting to make a transition where they're looking at us maintaining a certain minimal value uh, proposition, but also reducing cost. So I think a lot of what we learned over the last five to eight years working together in this manner has really positioned us to be leaders at this medical center to take a tool, a population management tool, which will be deployed throughout the nation as these EMRs mature. So it's a really rich environment. Our challenge is going to be where do we spend our time because it literally could be a thousand different opportunities, but we got to figure out where's the highest value. And, and I think the driver for that is going to be as it always has money, meaning the way the insurance contracts are written, they're going to tell us focus on these diseases and these cost-saving opportunities, and that's where we're probably going to try to align ourselves. Well, with that, I want to thank everyone here in the audience for joining us today and our online audience and those folks from Ohio State that joined us as well. So we uh, really appreciate your time coming out and to our speakers for doing a, a terrific job of telling us about the collaboration between the, the Division of Internal Medicine as well as the College of Pharmacy. Thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity.